Hello, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our author webinar. Uh, my name is Sandra Ndoro, and I'm currently the Public Relations Officer for Oasis International Publishing, primarily responsible for publicity management. For our webinar today, we have Dr. M.D. Kinoti, the esteemed author of the book, Making Peace with Fire, Harnessing Conflict to Transform Your Relationships. He'll be answering a few questions, giving some insights on his book, his inspiration and its purpose. Dr. Kinoti is a prominent scholar, professor and author in the fields of peace and development. He holds a PhD in peace building from Fuller Theological Seminary where he focused on the church's role in fostering peace in 21st century urban environments. Since 2008, Dr. Kinoti has trained leaders in peace building skills across more than 20 countries. Currently, he serves as a professor of, of nonprofit management at Regis University in Denver, Colorado, where he also directs the master's programs in nonprofit management and sustainable development. His book, Making Peace with Fire Harnessing Conflict to Transform Your Relationship, reflects his commitments to integrating faith based approaches with conflict resolution and peace building initiatives globally. Dr. Kinoti, we are in the presence of greatness. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm not sure about greatness, but I'm excited <laughs> to be here. No, you have an impressive resume, so it is good to have you. And we are all excited to learn more about your exciting, interesting, and also very informative book. So what inspired you to write Making Peace with Fire? Was there a specific event or personal experience that served as a catalyst? Well, Sandra, thank you. Um... First of all, thank you everyone who made the time to come today and to uh, participate with us in this conversation. I'm excited to be part of the dialogue and continuing the discussion about this very, very important uh, topic. Uh, what inspired me to write this book was a multiple, uh, multiple number of things. One, it was my own personal experience growing up in a community uh, in Meru, Kenya. Um, growing up with uh, in a family that had experienced conflict, I, I think that's generally true for most families. That you, um, they, there are some things that are going on within any family, and then uh, our community, the Meru tribe. I, from an early age, I was told we were enemies to the Dorobo and uh, Boran and the Somalis on the north. I don't know why, but that's that's how it, it came up. I also was told we were enemies within um, our own community against another clan, and and I don't know why. So I grew up in a context of conflict, uh, and of course, uh, growing up in the 80s, we have other uh, countries around Kenya and the East African region, Central Africa as well, having conflicts. So the drumbeat of conflict was all over my life from a personal perspective, family, community, nation, and even the continent. Um, and um, as you go into the 90s, you have uh, Somalia and other countries which have uh, real significant conflicts as well, and people dying there, Uganda as well, and, and then Rwanda. So conflict was always there for me. Then I went to work with World Vision International in community development, and I couldn't help, especially because I was posted in a different tribal community, I couldn't help uh, recognize that I was an outsider and really treated very different because of that. And so these tensions uh, yeah. always helped heighten my sensitivity to why are we really in this much conflict as human beings? And, and then on after several years working for World Vision, deciding, I think this is a big, this is an area that I need to explore some more. So I went to seminary to study and, and then later now I teach that kind of work. So the, all those experiences, everything I just explained there and more, and my study of the Bible, for sure, because as a Christian, I started to see the, the thread of uh, being a peacemaker or blessed are the peacemakers, but very little of that was translating or is translating mm -hmm. into the way we live with one another. 
So that's what really drew me to stay uh, connected with that material, mm-hmm. processing that, and then trying to write about it and and to speak about it as much as I can. Wow, that's that's, that's amazing. They do say experience is the best teacher. Um, and now you're teaching all of us how to resolve conflict. That's wonderful. Um, so the title, Making Peace with Fire, is quite evocative. It's important for individuals or society to make peace with it. Yes, and, and I think there was a break there in terms of in the question, uh, but I think what you're asking, you're saying that the title is evocative, using the, the, the word fire and uh, how we understand fire. Uh, most of you, all of us, know fire. We know it from, uh, it is a real resource for every one of us. It, it warms us if you have it in your house or whatever place. Uh, it helps us to cook. It helps us to uh, smelt and and um, purify metals. Yes. It is a it is a very uh, resourceful part of our lives. Mm-hmm. But fire left unattended. Mm-hmm. If you light a fire in any place that it's not attended, uh, it will be a disaster. Um, I live in Col- I live in Colorado. And uh, in the Western states of the United States, beginning, you know, starting in Colorado and other states going all the way to California, we have uh, seasons that we consider to be uh, fire seasons, especially when they, it's dry and there's a lot of um, stuff that can be burned. And much of that does cause a significant amount of destruction because that kind of fire is unattended. In almost all our homes, we have fire that we're using that when attended for, when it's controlled, when it's used the right way, it helps us to do, you know, it helps us a great deal. It's, it makes our lives much more comfortable. But when unattended, it's a mm. strong power that can destroy. And that's how I see conflict. Conflict is normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no one person that will tell you in their life that they don't have conflict. Even just... Even if you were born as a twin and you had a relationship that was great with your twin brother or your sister, mm-hmm. there has to be some friction at some point because that's just being human. So it's normal. It's just mm-hmm. like the fire we have in our homes, which is normal we can use. If we control that, if we control mm-hmm. the kind of relationships we end up with, it, it helps us to um do more it helps us to clarify our, our relationships clarify our goals uh, it helps us to learn uh the kind of things we fight about are usually because you know i see things differently or there is an allocation of resources that is going in a way that i you know we need to talk about mm-hmm. so in you know, all those instances instances where we're able to talk about and and come to a consensus we are controlling the fire but in environments where we leave it uh, unattended, whether we 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 sweep it under the rug and they say, or we yell and and quarrel and fight and mm-hmm. attack one another, whether violently or not, mm-hmm. that is the unattended fire. And so I use those I use the title this way um, just to capture the attention of, of anybody who is interested to to read just. So to to be curious, what, what is mm. this about? And it's, so it's a metaphor that I think applies across mm. the board in many, many ways. Yeah, absolutely. A very impactful metaphor indeed. So going on to the next uh, question I have here. Um, do you, well, looking at the book, um, it seems to explore themes of conflict and reconciliation. Do you think these themes are especially relevant today? And how do you hope readers will connect with them oh wow that's that's the that's a real question i first of all i write this book from uh my african background Uh, i am an african i also write this book as a christian Mm -hmm. so what you're gonna find here is i'm trying to navigate the space between what i grew up with my identity as well as uh, really my strong Christian identity. So I, I do bring the scriptures to bear on what I think. And therefore, but I ex- expect this book to be available and 
uh, accessible to anyone, uh, whether they have a Christian faith or not. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's it's timely because um, look around us. Every mm-hmm. part of our world today, uh, whether it's our personal world or in our community or international world, we're dealing with some kind of uh, of conflict, big and small, uh, destructive mm-hmm. and less destructive. So mm-hmm. I think this is this is material that I would recommend not just for uh, you know someone who is curious to know mm-hmm. what's going on, but also for leaders. Uh, mm-hmm. Indeed, I would recommend it um, as a something to be taught within churches and and, and church leaders to pick up and and look at this and say. What parts of this can I teach? What can I encourage my congregation to think about? Because I spent time looking at the scriptures and looking at how how to not just bring my Africanness into it or the stories that I have experienced now, especially now that as a as well as an immigrant into the United States. It's just look at how this material can be applied to engage communities and engage people to think more to ones living at peace and you did ask the question about reconciliation yes yes the goal is for us to live at peace with all people with all men as the bible says that's and true. that's the part of reconciliation living at peace is really living in the being reconciled with other people mm-hmm. they're not fighting or or being torn apart by our conflicts yeah absolutely yeah peace peace is uh, possible and especially in the times that we're living in now the message of peace needs to to spread yeah absolutely um so how was writing this book or how has writing this book changed your own perspective on peace conflicts or reconciliation did you get any epiphanies or any insights as you were going through the writing process? Well, I think what you asked if there was any epiphanies that I got through writing this book and if there was any part of this that yes. was, uh, was, was um, you, know, you know, that changed me. Yes, a great deal of it. One was really spending mm-hmm. spending more time looking at what the Bible says about peace mm-hmm. and, and, and peace building and peacemaking. And, and that to me was, you know, of course, I am, and done a PhD in that line and and being trained by some of the best uh, peace thinkers like Grant Stassen at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. Um, and, and But coming back to try and distill this in a way that I can communicate to a wider audience, mm-hmm. that it, this was not an academic exercise, mm-hmm. it was, was really useful. And, and I have to give a shout out here to Anna Lasmussen, who was... Uh, who worked with me as the editor on the other side, because she kept asking those questions, the deeper questions of how is this going to be understood by the by the person who doesn't have your kind of academic background? How do we make this accessible to the majority? And I can't say enough about just how much of a blessing she was through that journey. So mm-hmm. forcing me to uh, think, you know, uh, as a way of communicating to the to the general audience. Mm-hmm. That was one thing that I learned. I, I, mm-hmm. I'm a professor, I teach at a college, so um, my training is to be more sophisticated and to mm-hmm. sound sound learned and to use these big terms. But coming to the point where I'm able to communicate at a level that it's storytelling, it's a level where most people can understand. That was actually one of the biggest things that I learned over the process was how how do we bring the knowledge that we have, especially those of us who are who have been gifted in different ways to engage in knowledge? How do we bring that to the rest of to everyone else? And I, I I'm mm. eternally grateful for just just that one lesson alone was was worth the, yeah. the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Great. And what advice would you give to readers who are currently struggling with their own fire or inner conflicts? Well, what can I say to anybody who picks up this material and anybody who is struggling with any conflicts, whether you're in this call or elsewhere, is embrace, embrace the conflict as an opportunity for growth rather than something to be avoided. I think I make that case very strongly in the book. I also say practice active. There are certain 
practices that lend it lend the conflicts easier to manage. You know, things like active listening, trusting the other person. And I know it's always difficult to do that. Uh, realizing, recognizing that the differences that we have and the differences uh, that we are created with, that is, that's a God thing. It's not something we, uh, you know, woke up one day and decided I'm going to be different mm -hmm. from my my sister or my brother. It's just that's how we create it. So embrace that as well. And then use reflection, self-reflection in terms of how do I do things and what really helps uh, what have I seen to help in my relationships with other people? And how can I continue to build on what I've seen to work and not? But I think if anybody is here on this call and they, they are old to faith and they are Christians, I would say we, we really do need to take seriously our faith. Um, and mm -hmm. look, the Bible is very, very strong, uh, strongly um hand good to ones, skewed to ones, peace and peace building. Yes. Uh, there's no question about yes. that. And it starts with God making peace with us, seeing us. And there is, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's him. He, he he takes the initiative as the, as Paul says in in Ephesians, he says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died mm -hmm. for us. But it's yes. Ephesians or, or Romans, I no, I don't know the. I don't have the the reference right now. He took the initiative to make peace with us, and I think as Christians we are called to do the same. Now I'm not casting a blanket. Um, you know I'm not saying this must work every time. There are issues that need to be discussed. There are times when you have to walk away. There are times when, if it's abuse, you have to think, why? Well, what am I putting myself into? But the intention and the focus and the way to think about how we truly work to one's peace, um, I think that's that's a call that all of us as Christians have been called to, and we need to take it more seriously. And I would say for myself and for, uh, I don't always do that. Mm -hmm. I don't always approach my my circumstances and my relationships with, I want to make this work from a peaceful, positive peace perspective. Uh, yes. And therefore it's a challenge for me to do that. And I would challenge everybody else to do that. But the second part to that is, this is not just a Christian message, although mm -hmm. that's where I come from and that's where I'm grounded. I would challenge anybody else. If you're here, you don't have faith or you hear this message and you don't have faith, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Christian faith, of course I wish you have Christian faith, but if you you belong to a different religion, mm -hmm. I would like to see more books, more conversations, more mm -hmm. seminars and workshops run from any mm -hmm. other perspective, any other background. Mm -hmm. You know, the Muslim Muslim authors writing about peace from their perspective, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhist folks writing about peace and relationship building from their perspective. I don't think we have we have enough of that material in the world. And, and therefore, my challenge to anyone, to everyone, is write from your perspective and write for mm -hmm. positive peace and how we can develop that in our world today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kinoti. Um, well said, I couldn't have, I couldn't agree more. That That, that is wonderful. Um, Dr. Kinoti, how your book can transform our conflict resolution with effective tools. Helpful, Sam, especially Sam, in the Sam, time Sam, of living in, riddled with conflict. Yes, yeah. can you hear me? Sorry, I, I think the question, uh, you broke up there for a second, but I think what you're asking is how can we use some of this material to transform conflict in the times that we're living in? Uh, those of us who live in the United States know we've just gone through a very... Um, tumultuous time, I would call it that, honestly. Uh, and the division, the divisions are not going to go away, uh, especially we, we, because we've just gone through a, a divisive period of um, electioneering and, and voting. Uh, and and you can say that of any any other part of the world. I would say. I mean, uh, my my Bath country, Kenya, went through the same thing in the last few months as well with. Uh, Conflict has become a very 
a commonplace uh, problem for all of us. So again, I will repeat what I just said before. I don't think we have enough material to encourage us to live at peace. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is a good place to begin, and it has um, a huge amount of material that teaches us how to live at peace. And I think a book like this or other books are welcome to try and help us to uh, reshape the way we think, the way we do our lives in terms of really making peace and living mm -hmm. at peace with other people. Uh, and even um, just figuring out, mm -hmm. you know, just where to begin. This is an introduction. It doesn't mm -hmm. claim to this material doesn't claim to have all the answers to um, mm -hmm. the community and national and international conflicts. I start with this as an inter, interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. God willing, God giving me the grace, I would like to write the next book, which is for the communities and maybe international peace building, which is what mm -hmm. I actually teach now. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I feel that starting from the individual, starting from interpersonal relationships in families, in, in our churches, in our communities. So that's a good place. And I would, I would, uh, I would say that we, we have the tools, we have some beginning tools that we can start to apply and to use. Mm. I think oftentimes we don't use them as well as we could. And that's, that's my, my, my very strong appeal is um, mm. instead of walking away from your relationships just because you have a conflict with your friend or your or your neighbor or your family, uh, consider yes. working through some of those difficulties. And, and the Bible is a good place to start for sure. And this mm. book, you know, points to the Bible because I think that's, that's, that's the word of God and I think that's where uh, we shouldn't be going. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kinoti. I've actually read your book and I must say I've learned a lot. It has really opened my mind, ways to resolve conflict. Um, I, for one, was a person who would run away from conflict, but now I'm realizing to preserve relationships, you need to face it head on, face that fire that is in each of us. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kinoti. Uh, lovely insights you've shared there. Um, everybody, uh, just to let you know, Dr. Kinoti's book is available on Amazon. We have a link in the chat, so feel free to go through to the link. This is especially a fantastic gift, especially during this uh, holiday period to share with friends and family. We all have that family member who is always stirring the pot and causing conflict. This could be a tool that they can use to resolve conflicts and also for all of us to, to see how we can handle uh, conflict as it arrives. So. As Dr. Kinoti also mentioned, this book is actually in season because we've just gone through the contentious elections. So for Thanksgiving, this will be a great book to use <laughs> for that relative or that family member who is always... All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kinoti. Um, now we're just going to open the floor to questions. So if you have any questions, please share them in the chat. Uh, we will then uh, address them to uh, Dr. Kinoti. Please feel free to share your questions in the chat box. All right, so whilst we wait for the questions to roll in, Dr. Kinoti, are you thinking of maybe working on another book as a follow up or are you focusing? on the current book as is and you know continuing with the workshops as you are doing right now well that's a good question i'm i'm actually doing both uh yes. well actually three things one i continue to teach on peace and development which is what uh, i teach here at regis university and loving that enjoying that um mm -hmm. i'm teaching a class on uh beginning january and i have a class on uh, strategies for peace building, and that's that's actually looking at international peace building. Uh, the second thing that I'm working on is is actually a textbook with a colleague, and we are doing um, a material on um, the role of leaders, especially in the nonprofit world, uh, in peace building. So we're looking at how can you build peace within your organization but also into the communities where you might be working or you have, you have your, your services. Uh, 
And then uh, the last one that I really am trusting God for, and this is probably a 10 year plan program is, is to write a, a, a book on peace and development as, as a mm. textbook for, that's for training, beautiful. for training yes. undergraduate and graduate programs. So mm. that's a much longer term uh, mm. program. And, and therefore the one that I'm excited about is, is one that I'm working with uh, or with a colleague right now. Mm -hmm. And we actually got a few chapters done. So well, that's and exciting. That should, be, that should mm -hmm. be done by the mm -hmm. end of 2026. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so I also wanted to ask you, I mean, for, for those who haven't yet read the book, can you give us um, a short example from your book where there was some, uh, conflict resolution, a practical example? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what can I think of real quick? Um, when I was working for uh, for World Vision uh, in Kenya, uh, one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that used to happen a, a great deal is we'll get these memos, um, you know, from, from whoever was in leadership, which is very, very common. Uh, but often it wasn't uh, that easy to really understand the mindset of the person behind it. And, and one of the things that I, um, I at the time, you know, I was in my 20s, uh, so I was quite idealistic. You know, I remember going up against one of my, my bosses and almost challenging them, you know, just in the, in the uh, proudful, prideful mm. 20s, seven yeah, year old type yes. way. and and this gentleman was much older he he was probably in his uh, late 50s and um and he sat me down and said uh, something that has lived with me for many years after uh, one he yeah. said well well anytime you come to something that you do not really understand well enough or do not know uh, or you think is is negative or is not something mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. That you expected. It is always yes. best to lead with to lead with um, curiosity. One yes. and mm -hmm. two, um, try and come with solutions instead of uh, in instead of attacking. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that has stayed with me. And so I give that example. I believe I give yeah. that in the book. Mm -hmm. Talk about how um, it has helped me to think, especially when I'm in a conflict situation and. And especially when I do mediation, mm. uh, I will encourage the, the the parties that come to mediation to think about how what kind of solution, what kind of positive solution can you imagine to this issue? Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. that because we get caught up when conflict arises, we get caught up mm. in our emotions a lot of times, and yes. we start to attack to attack, and therefore mm -hmm. dig ourselves into deeper holes. <laughs> but if we can if, if we can get the grace, if God can give us the grace, or even if we can be able to shake ourselves out of the, the situation and step back and start thinking about mm. how can this turn out different, or even the curiosity side, mm. what am I missing here? Mm. What is it that mm. I mm. don't seem to know about where she was coming from or where he was coming from? What is the issues that might have driven her to that point? Mm -hmm. Anytime we lead with that kind of curiosity, what we're doing is we we are, of course, externalizing the issues from that person mm -hmm. and from myself. And now it becomes an issue. It is an issue that we need to address. It's not mm -hmm. she is mean or she is difficult or he is, he is rude or he is, he is, uh, he is, is uh, troublesome. It's now an issue, mm. and that and issues are easier to uh, to handle than when we uh, when we make it about the character of the other person or we we try to diminish them. That's true. Oh, wonderful! I, I also got the point the, of the importance of self reflection. You know, look at yourself. Where am I missing it? That's that's very key, um, very important. All right. Um, so just waiting for some questions to come through. We haven't had any questions yet, um, but we can continue. I think we do. I think we actually oh, we do. do. We have a question on. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. have spent much time in Sierra Leone, the Endua oh, 11 years of civil war. 
when people have suffered grievously, how best can they let go of their anger and loss? Mm. Brent, Brent, I don't, I don't have a very good answer to that question, and and this is where I am exploring perspectives in terms of uh, peace building at the community, national, international level. I don't have a very good answer to that question, mm-hmm. but in, in for folks who have experienced significant loss and significant conflict, uh, mm-hmm. take the case of Rwanda for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I travel to Rwanda often. I, I'm there at least once a year. And I remember meeting folks who had experienced real uh, conflict where they lost family members. I remember talking to one woman who shared how uh, she lost a, a family through a neighbor. A neighbor actually conspired and they were killed. But she's come to the point of uh, over the years, she's trusting God, she's become a Christian, and she has learned to forgive. Mm-hmm. The operating words there are learned to forgive. She doesn't say she's forgiven. Mm. She's learning how to forgive. And it's an, a progressive process. Yes. I don't, I can't, I cannot pretend to know the the pain that people who have gone through civil war, for example, have experienced. Mm. But mm. I see the teachings of the scriptures that's, that talk about forgiveness. Mm. And I wonder whether that's not a place to begin and mm-hmm. not recognizing that you'll probably not be in, in the lifetime of that person to forgive, but carrying the burden of the conflict and hating other people uh, because it, they, they killed or they did something, mm-hmm. it's probably not going to be something that will heal them. So yes. I, would offer, I would offer that as a beginning. I know there are so many other issues. There are so many other areas. There are, mm-hmm. might be conf- a place for confrontation. There might be an, an area for uh, reparations and payments, uh, mm-hmm. but I I honestly think that my that might be a place to start. Yes. Mm. Olu does say, do your book yes. contain alternative dispute resolution philosophy mostly being pushed down, pushed now in Africa? Do you intend to donate some of the books to regional and continental organizations in Africa? Um, the second part of that question is an oasis question, so I'll leave that alone. But I will, I will address the first part of the question, which is alternative resolution uh, ADR. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with the with the idea to institute uh, ADR processes in Africa and other parts of the world. But by the way, we've always done ADR in Africa. We've always done alternative dispute resolutions at least where I grew up in the villages, that was the most common way for us to address our issues. If there was a conflict, the elders were caught around, uh, or you went to the neighbors and they came and helped to figure out how to address the issues that you know either the family or the community was facing. There were very few courts. There mm-hmm. was very, the police, um, mm-hmm. in most parts of rural Africa is ineffective. So, uh, the courts and the magistrates and the judges and all that is not there. So mm-hmm. we've always practiced ADR. I think what mm-hmm. you're saying is this is being invited into the national dialogue and in the national practice. And I would say, I would highly encourage that, but I would also encourage folks like yourself who are based in the continent and who are, who are interested to actually study this and mm-hmm. to offer it as a real process for uh, addressing our issues. So to study how to do it from an African perspective and to implement that in a good way to support us. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh, thank you, Doctor. That was uh, very, very insightful, um, well explained. We have another question here uh, from Olu. Um, how do you see the roles being played by Western power as often the case in regular conflicts in Africa because they benefit largely in conflicts in Africa. How do we address this to ensure peace in our continent? Well, that's again an international question. And Mm -hmm. by the way, something flashed on my screen here that said four minutes uh, left for the call. So I'll try and answer this in in, in one or two minutes. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Although that's a great question. Again, it's at the international level. I think there is a lot more that needs to be talked about there. We, my position, this is purely my position. Mm-hmm. We need to encourage the strengthening of, of international multilateral organizations like the United Nations and to offer uh, places where 
disputes can be addressed beyond uh, the nations and beyond uh, those who would like to instigate them so that they can gain from them. So African Union, uh, United Nations and other regional organizations and international organizations and bodies where we these nations subscribe to, to me will be the places where we need to be uh, pushing for and strengthening as a place to work through the issues that currently uh, some people some countries or some regions are taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. Right, wonderful. Thank you. I hope that was a, a, a great answer for you, Olu. I hope it cleared things for you uh, and for everybody as well. Okay. Um, well, we can round off our uh, webinar. We've got about three minutes until uh, the cutoff time, but please feel free, um, even after the 40 minutes is over, to stay behind if you still have more uh, questions for Dr. Kinoti. Uh, everybody else, if you, um, you know, if you have other commitments or if you don't have any questions, you can feel free to leave, but um, yeah, others, we can just stay behind and, and continue the discussion. It's very engaging, very insightful, very interesting, and very helpful. Thank you, uh, Doctor. We have another question. Uh, we've got a compliment from Tim. Uh, just to round off the, the webinar, in your experience, um, why do you think people struggle or run away from conflict? As a person who runs away from conflict, what do you think people run away from it instead of addressing it? Good question. Why do we tend to run away from conflict instead of confronting or even uh, working with it? Uh, conflict makes us feel uncomfortable. It's Again, it, let's go back to the fire as a, as a metaphor. Uh, if you stick your finger too close to the fire, it will burn you. And when conflict uh, arises, the fire is getting closer to us. Uh, we're getting to the to the areas and the places where we are not too comfortable with what what we are feeling, what it raises within us, and the things that uh, you know we sometimes do not want to confront in us. And and so therefore it is it is uncomfortable. It's 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 easier to sometimes it's easier to run unless we cannot run, and and sometimes it's easier to ignore unless we cannot ignore it. Uh, so again, a lot of these some of and then there's the way we are trained. You know, the, most of us who grew up uh, in whatever family you grew up with. They, you are encouraged to do conflict in different ways. Uh, some of some of the families will say, "No, you don't talk about it," and some other families it was, "If you hit me, I hit you back, as hard as I can." In fact, we use those metaphors in the book as well. Uh, those of you who speak so, hey, you know, dao e moto ni moto. You know, we fight fire with fire, and that's the English uh, translation of that. So there, there was the. Um, there was those that kind of training that did not does not help us as well. Uh, society is full of examples and ways of us wanting to fight again so that we don't we we don't we don't look weak. We don't look like we are letting somebody uh, take advantage of us. So we go fighting instead of of looking at how can this be an issue that I I work with and resolve um, and. Unfortunately, uh, those and, uh, experiences only go on to strengthen what we do in future, the way we work with things in the future. If we learn to run away, we keep running. If we run to, if what we have learned is to fight, we keep fighting. I'm inviting us to the middle where we engage and think about how we can work uh, together with these issues. This has been great, uh, Dr. Kenoti, and I, um, you know, I, I just think of the the metaphor of, and and what you just brought up about when fire is involved, there's a fight or flight instinct often, and we almost need to retrain our brains to say, okay, fire is involved, 
let's bring some sort of indication to the conversation or the argument that, hey, let's use this fire to make our relationship better. And I, I just I just think I've been really kind of just pondering it as you've been um, sharing your your ideas and your learnings. It's it's really a remarkable and powerful idea. So yeah, thank you to all of you who have joined. I'm Steve Nelson and I'm a vice president for Global Partnerships North America. And it's been just really great to have you all involved. Um, we did have an issue where some people weren't able to join because of our link. And so um, hopefully we'll have that technical issue fixed for our next author webinar. Um, but Dr. Canotti, thanks so much. If people want to stay on, they can even, I think, maybe potentially unmute themselves and, and share uh, with us for a little while. Um, Sandra, thank you so much for leading our conversation today. And we'll also be getting this uh, audio recording out to, or the, the video recording out to people as well to, to share with people. And uh, please purchase the book. It's, it's uh, Christmas season. So we'd love uh, for people to give them as gifts. And um, I, I haven't totally read the book, but I've, I've uh, looked through it. And I just think there's so many important lessons for all of us. So thank you, Dr. Kenobi. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll just see if anyone wants to stay on. Yes, yeah. Boca, do you have a way to unmute everyone? Uh, not at once, but I can go one by one if somebody lets me know that they want to speak. Well, why don't you just go ahead and unmute people if, I don't know. Yeah, people can leave it in the chat. Hmm. So. Yeah. Well, that was terrific, though. Thank you so much for a writing the book and yeah. um, for sharing your message with the world. And uh, yeah, I think that that other question about how do we get the books mm -hmm. to ministries in Africa mm -hmm. is certainly a big part of what Oasis is about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if free books is always the answer, but certainly. Every book has a price, even if it's shipped or, um, you know, the print costs, so, someone pays for it, right? And yeah. so there are times when donors perhaps like to um, encourage a, a ministry to have books at their disposal. We can certainly work with that as well. So that's, that's always a great uh, way to arrange something like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody now has the ability to unmute themselves and speak mm -hmm. if they'd like to. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't think uh, maybe some of the, uh, I, I know uh, there might be some ways to, um, again, somebody paying for this, uh, but maybe sending to some of the organizations that uh, Christian organizations or even uh, bigger churches within, you know, in places where you you have contact, mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be a useful way to introduce the, the material. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm also looking forward to your textbook in the future. I think it's a it's a great tool, a great learning tool for for institutions, for companies. Uh, absolutely, mm -hmm. something that 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 we need, you know, because yeah, conflict is is not an easy thing to to handle, and a lot of people revert to anger and blame. So that is that will be very useful and helpful. We're working on it, and <laughs> if I can, if I can get. Um... Um, my days can be about 36 hours. Yes, mm. I'll, I'll get it done soon. <laughs> yeah, right. that would be amazing. Um, yeah, but right, right now, it's uh, yeah, we, we have uh, we have some beginning conversation. We we've started with a few chapters, and so my colleague and I, so we're we're working on that. Mm. Um, I, I hope uh, we've set ourselves the goal of. 
uh, June 2026 to be done. I, I hope we can do it sooner, actually. So yeah, hmm. awesome. That would be amazing. Yes, <laughs> yeah. hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I just say uh, I'm just able to unmute myself now. I just want to say a few, uh, make a few contributions to what I've had so far. Uh, I'm I'm a Nigerian and I live in Canada. I'm calling uh, coming in from uh, Canada. So I, I keep looking at uh, how, uh, when we talk about uh, peace, peace and peace. I'm sure everybody want peace. Mm -hmm. Sandra want peace. Yes. Uh, Steve want peace. But peace has eluded us in most cases. And one of the things I always talk about is inequalities around the globe. For instance, mm -hmm. we're talking about United Nations. We have permanent members who are there. For centuries up to now, Africa is here to have a voice. This is part of what we're talking about. The lack of peace starts from there when Africa doesn't have a platform to make a decision. For instance, it has an issue going on. One of the five permanent members, one of them decide to vote against it. It, is, it becomes non-issue. And some of these things we're talking about affect Africa. And no, nobody has, uh, I mean, the continent, the continent doesn't have opportunity to speak at that level. If we are talking about peace, can we start from peace at the global level so that it can trickle down to the continental, regional, and things like that? But so far, so good. I want to commend uh, uh, Kinoti for a brilliant uh, submission today. And I look forward to uh, buying the books, no matter the amount. I just have to, you know, particularly, not only to learn from the book, but to appreciate uh, is a scholarly uh, effort. Thank you very much. Brother Olu, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, the international system that is set up for uh, developing and sustaining peace is, is broken. There's no question about that. I just came back from um, some meetings at the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly last month. And these were the kind of conversations that were going on in the other, in not in the General Assembly, but in other meetings on, on the sidelines. And, and the question was, why do we have these the two-tier system? Why do we have the, the, the permanent members and why do we have everybody else? And nations, all by the, light, the right of being nations, by their sovereignty, aren't they um, supposed to have a seat at the table? in some ways. Uh, the system was set up in 19, whatever, in the 1940s, um, and it has been entrenched over the years, and it probably will not change anytime soon. Yes. So therefore, I do not expect peace to come from top down. My proposal, my thinking, and my writing uh, this book is that peace begins with us, with the individuals. It's the interpersonal connections, it's the interpersonal relationships that really all bring us the kind of peace we need in our communities. But by chance, it might actually trickle up to these other places where we start to regard everybody else as created in the image of God, and therefore they have the dignity and we need to treat them as such. And so whether we are treating that person in the community or in our family or at the international level, we consider other people that way. But I don't know that the system that we have right now that is from the 1940s is going to change anytime soon. Mm. I'm not going to hold my breath until they figure that out before I can start mm. building a good relationship with my neighbor or with my brothers and sisters. That's what I'm saying. So. And I wish it were different. I wish we could actually have a system that is fairer, that is a, uh, that is equal. I don't see that happening anytime soon, unfortunately. I'll go further to argue that I think we have a chance to do that as a church. Mm -hmm. But again, from the church perspective, we are so beholden to our na national politics that even that, even even the way we treat each other within within churches or within the church itself, we, we have the kind of tier system where we, if you're from a certain denomination, we don't consider you as a brother, sister, the same way. 
uh, and if you're from a different country, well, we're not exactly sure that you believe the right gospel or such. So is there a way to go back to our document, the Bible, and figure out how do I truly love God and how to re- do I truly love my neighbor? Uh, and that process is, is interpersonal and it can go to the national as well, or international. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you don't mind me to make another contribution, I can go ahead if you give me the permission. Can I go oh, ahead? Sure. Yes, I mean, yes. I, you can. I okay. <laughs> yeah. I just want to digress a little bit to another very vesting, you know, aspect of uh, of our life that uh, is causing instability, lack of peace. Um, I know, I know, <laughs> I know this, this is a very controversial something that I want to share, but I believe that I have that freedom of speech to express my feelings as regard the issue of, uh, you know, forcing African, you know, continent to accept, uh, you know, this philosophy of a gay lifestyle, whereas we should be able to respect our different international and continental and regional stroke um, cultural affinities. So there's no point in Western world forcing the, you know, countries in Africa to adopt their lifestyle. There should be an opportunity for people to show their you know, ways of life based on their cultural background and religious uh, sensibilities. But when the big brothers, they continue to force in Africa that uh, you must accept this lifestyle, otherwise you're not going to get aid from the World Bank or support from IMF. This is part of, uh, you know, you know, conflict uh, issues that doesn't give, uh, give room for peace. In our continent. So, what you adhere to this, uh, you know, this forcing Africa to accept something that is against their ideologies and cultural beliefs. Even though some of us, we are Africans, we live in this part of the world, but we have we've accepted the lifestyle. But what happened in Africa? I have. I want to hear your views. Thank you. I. This is not my my area of interaction or research or thought. Um, what Africa decides to accept in all, and I, again, we lump Africa as a big, big, uh, it's a big continent, and we, we lump it all together as one small place. Um, anytime you're accepting a loan or you're accepting any kind of donation from anyone, there is always uh, strings attached to it. I don't think that... Um, so, and I don't know, I haven't studied any of the documents uh, for these uh, loans and for this, for this help to know exactly the writing, you know, that is in those documents and how much of it is, is contingent upon accepting uh, certain conditions, including the, the LGBTQ and other conditions. So I don't know, I, and I couldn't comment on that because it's not my, my place. I think the the one place I will go back to, though, is to say a huge amount of this, and we never should forget this at all, a huge amount of this, uh, the reasons why human beings, we can't get along as well, is because we are sinners. We begin there. Every one of us is a sinner. The Bible tells us that. We all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So, it behooves us to first of all look internally, to self-reflect how much of my sinfulness is contributing to where things are in my community, in my family, and in my community right now, even before we go to the nations. And I think that's where I am. Now, in terms of this material, this book, that is where I want to challenge people to look. Look at yourself, look at myself, and and see the fact that I am broken. I am a sinner. I need to be reconciled first of all with God and then the reconciliation with the people around me. I bet you if we began there and we were honest enough, some of the, the concerns that we have at the, at the national and the international level, um, they might be easier to navigate. But when it comes to 
who I'm borrowing money from or the nation is borrowing money from and what conditions they put in place. Those are things that not very few of us get the opportunity to look at and really say that we can see that this is truly what they're asking for. So I do encourage you to, um, you know, continue the, the push as it sounds like you're working on that. I encourage you to continue to push on that direction. But please start with the self-reflection and the self-identification uh, of where you are before we start to demonize and um, you know, disparage other people, because I think that continues the conflicts that we in, uh, experience. And that's what I've written about. I have not gotten to that other issue, and I don't know that I'll ever get to that issue, because it, I don't know how much of that is, is, is true, and I don't know how much of it is, is uh, being forced, and I don't know much um, how uh, those countries in Africa have to say, no, I can't do that, I won't do that, I won't go there. Um, yes, I'm struggling answering the question, as you can tell. <laughs> It's not my, yeah. my fault. No, that, that's been terrific. I, I actually appreciated your response. And, you know, I think we'll probably wrap up the call now. And just really a huge thank you to you, Sandra, for being our host. And then certainly, Dr. Canotti, for your um, participation and, and, and sharing. So thank you, everyone who joined. And we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.